Dr. Donald Abrams is the past chief of the Hematology Oncology Division at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, an integrative oncologist at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, and Professor Emeritus of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He has conducted numerous clinical trials investigating conventional as well as complementary therapies in patients, including therapeutic touch, traditional Chinese medicine interventions, medicinal mushrooms, medical marijuana, and distant healing. His particular passion in the field involves nutrition and cancer. Dr. Abrams has been providing integrative medicine consultation and group medical visits to people living with and beyond cancer at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Donald Abrams. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Donald Abrams and I'm here to talk to you today about medicinal mushrooms. And I do have some uh, disclosures that I wanna share. Uh, hang on one second, I will uh, advance slide, yeah, good. So uh, I am a scientific advisor to a website called Wellcasa, which provides information on uh, potential interactions between supplements and pharmaceutical drugs and also got a speaker honorarium from Metagenics in Australia. I'm also a personal friend of Paul Stamets, who we're gonna hear about a little bit later on, and his company, Fungi Perfecti, uh, in the past has sent me my mushrooms, mostly at no cost. And then I did want to uh, share that I have never myself experienced any psychedelics. So I wanna start by uh, framing the talk around a patient case. This is a 31-year-old gentleman who I saw with metastatic rectal cancer, seeking an integrative health approach to fighting his cancer, uh, first seen in November of 2016. He had a history of five years of pelvic discomfort uh, that was not really uh, diagnosed. It was worse when he was biking or running. Uh, when he developed rectal bleeding, he was treated for hemorrhoids, but during his honeymoon in March of 2016, he was noted to have bad eating habits and also, uh, what he ate often would trigger worse pelvic pain. He finally convinced his uh, primary care provider to send him for colonoscopy, which revealed an ulcerating adenocarcinoma in the rectum, and his staging workup demonstrated a large liver mass and multiple bilateral small pulmonary nodules consistent with widely metastatic rectal cancer. So uh, he began chemotherapy at UCSF the week before I saw him at the Osher Center. His uh, profile, he was a filmmaker, married for one year to a Facebook employee. He was raised in a beef jerky sausage factory. Both of his parents died of cancer in 2008. He's the third of four uh, siblings having three sisters. He was raised Catholic and has resumed his church attendance and has now become very spiritual. For the past 10 months, he's adopted a vegan diet and, and gave up uh, alcohol as well. When asked about cannabis use, he said he used it less than a dozen times in the past, but he's now trying to become an expert. When asked what brings him joy, he said children, dance parties at home. When I asked him what his hopes are, he said, I have too many hopes. To, and then he said to beat the cancer. When asked where his strength comes from, he said his DNA his friends and his family. On examination, he was a healthy young man in no acute distress. He was uh, not obese or overweight. He had a chemotherapy port in his right chest and no swollen glands or enlarged liver. His current medications and supplements included aloe vera, beta-1,3 glucan, which is a medicinal mushroom uh, cell wall component, a multivitamin, an additional mitake mushroom capsule, turmeric, cannabis, and the antiemetics and uh, anti-diarrheal agents prescribed to go along with this chemotherapy. So mushrooms, uh, we all know that they can be very delicious foodstuffs. 
Uh, in fact, uh, we think of them as plants, but mushrooms are their own kingdom, the fungi, and they are more closely related to animals, in fact, than plants. So there are the edible mushrooms, and then there are also the so-called mycological nutraceuticals, so that mushrooms that serve as potential uh, therapeutic agents, uh, also widely available. In fact, a recent uh, view of uh, available products at uh, Whole Foods that I visited shows that they're now doing mushrooms with hot chocolate and coffee. Uh, they're pretty much all over the place. And uh, the uh, March 2022 said that uh, mushrooms are dominating uh, the supplements uh, list uh, currently, largely due to COVID and the ability or the desire to enhance the immune system. So what is the history of medicinal mushrooms? Uh, we in the West are a bit what I call fungophobic. We're fearful of mushrooms. In fact, I just got a my chart message today from a pharmacist asking, uh, should we stop this patient's mushrooms because her liver function tests are increased? Well, I think it's more likely that the liver function tests are increased uh, due to the chemo that she's getting and not the mushrooms. Uh, Asian and Eastern European societies are more fungophilic, if you will, where they like mushrooms and hot water decoctions or teas, if you will, from certain fungi have long been recognized to have health promoting effects, again, particularly in Eastern cultures. There are about 300 species of uh, fungi that are felt to have therapeutic potential. The crossover to the West actually was stimulated by data shown in the graph at the bottom uh, of this slide. Uh, farmers in the Japanese prefecture where they grow enokitake mushrooms, those are the thin white filamentous ones that are present in miso soup, uh, have much less rates of cancer uh, than farmers in neighboring prefectures. So this uh, allowed uh, scientists to look at these mushrooms and found that they have uh, specific active constituents that may have some anti-cancer activity. Medicinal mushrooms are, are uh, mushrooms in general uh, that are used uh, as medicine or as foods uh, generally are tastier than our traditional white button mushroom that we are so focused on in the West, that's in the agaricus family. Uh, the market for mushrooms, as I mentioned, is really skyrocketing. Uh, there is increasing evidence that uh, mushrooms might decrease, mushroom consumption might decrease the risk of cancer. A study in Japan looked at uh, 36,000 uh, men, uh, middle-aged men, followed for a median of 13 years. And they collected information on how often they consumed mushrooms. They identified 1,200 cases of prostate cancer, and they found that those who consumed mushrooms more than three times a week had a 17% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer, which was statistically significant. A case control study in China in 1,000 women with breast cancer and 1,000 age match control showed that uh, for those who uh, consume mushrooms, uh, their uh, risk of breast cancer was decreased 64% uh, for fresh mushrooms and 47% for dried mushrooms. And in fact, to show you that it's not just one food stuff, when the mushrooms are consumed in conjunction with green tea, uh, the risk reductions jump to 80 to 90%. And this effect was seen in both pre and post menopausal women. And I think the next slide, yeah, is uh, a more recent study published just last year. Uh, 17 observational studies were looked at in a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And they identified almost 20,000 cancer cases. Higher mushroom consumption was associated with a lower risk of total cancer. Uh, again, a 34% reduction. Uh, 35% reduction in breast cancer and a less robust but still statistically significant 20% reduction in non-breast cancer. These associations, however, were only observed in the Asian studies. And again, the strongest association was for reduced risk of breast cancer. Uh, this is a so-called forest plot 
and any dots to the left of the line going down the middle uh, suggest statistically significant findings. And if the line, uh, the horizontal line crosses that vertical line, it means it's not statistically significant. So again, this shows that breast cancer had the most uh, profound response to the consumption of mushrooms in reducing the risk. And again, this is uh, what I just uh, showed you previously. And one thing about mushrooms is that there are very few food sources of vitamin D or sunshine vitamin. Most of them are things that I do not recommend. Fortified orange juice, fortified milk. Those are two things that I don't suggest that people drink. Uh, other sources of vitamin D in the diet are deep cold water fish, the same fish that are good for omega-3 fatty acids, salmon, black cod, albacore tuna, herring mackerel, and sardines. But an interesting thing is if you take fresh mushrooms and put them outside in the sunshine, they will actually generate vitamin D2, which is less uh, uh, potent than vitamin D3, but still is a nice uh, food source of uh, vitamin D. What else do uh, mushrooms have? Well, they're, they're not a, a source of fat or cholesterol. Uh, they have a little potassium, uh, very low uh, carbohydrates, no sugar. Mainly they do have uh, some uh, other uh, vitamins uh, and uh, minerals in trace amounts. So uh, what is it uh, about mushrooms that makes them medicinal? Well, first of all, uh, the uh, mushroom life cycle is something that is very interesting because they start by producing a mycelial mat, if you will, underground that grows and grows and connects and is oftentimes in association with specific other uh, plants, uh, particularly trees. And then when the mycelium feel it's time uh, to reproduce, they pop up above ground and produce the so-called fruiting body, which is what we recognize uh, when we buy mushrooms in the store. And then to propagate themselves further, many mushrooms are producing spores, which they can eject uh, from underneath their cap at uh, speeds and intensities that they say are equivalent to launching a, a rocket from uh, Cape Kennedy. And those spores then go out further and uh, can get under the ground and reproduce new mycelia. So medicinal mushroom products actually are based on either mycelia or the uh, fruiting body, or even uh, some products are based on the spores. So there's a mycelia, uh, there are some fruiting bodies, and the spores uh, are get ejected uh, as seen there. Uh, so I mentioned in the uh, patient's story that he was taking a uh, beta-glucan. So the beta-D-glucan, it, it's a series of uh, sugar compounds that are connected in a way that we don't actually digest them uh, very well. And the uh, beta-glucans uh, simulate a bacterial cell wall so that we, when we ingest these medicinal mushrooms, our body is fooled into thinking that we're being infected by a bacteria. And it mounts a nonspecific immune response, stimulating cytotoxic T lymphocytes and natural killer cells to fight off the bacteria, which we also hope uh, will fight off cancer. So that's pretty much uh, how these mushrooms work. Again, the beta-glucan walls uh, demonstrated below, uh, complex with complement on the cells of the immune system that really turn on the immune response. And uh, you know, for this reason, I'll just state here, the immune activation of our new immune therapies is so potentially therapeutically beneficial that I tell my patients not to take medicinal mushrooms if they're on an immunotherapy because I don't want the mushrooms immune enhancement to, 
to interact or potentially decrease uh, the uh, very significantly therapeutic immune enhancement from the immunotherapies. This is just me, uh, one of my gestalts and fears, uh, but I do uh, present it to my patients who are on immunotherapy. I also don't think medicinal mushrooms should be taken by patients who have lymphoproliferative malignancies, that is chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia, the lymphomas, or multiple myeloma. But again, this is just Donald's prejudice and not based on any science because those cancers I feel are already an enhanced or hyperactivated immune system. And I don't want the mushrooms to enhance the immune system even further. So again, with regards to anti-cancer activities, there's this non-specific immunostimulant effect, which I just described. Uh, this activity may require intact function of the T lymphocytes. Uh, the activity is especially beneficial when used in conjunction with chemotherapy as well as radiation. So most of the studies conducted in Asia are in cancer patients who are receiving chemo and uh, radiation. And again, some of the components of the mushrooms may have direct cancer cell killing effects. Uh, the reishi mushroom we'll talk about in just a moment may have some anti-cancer activities, the enoki mushroom as well. And then the trace elements that I showed you uh, present in the mushroom may also have a role. Again, most of the studies and the licensed drugs are in Asia. Uh, we continue to say that more research is necessary. So the mushroom preparations that are used as biologic response modifiers, again, particularly in Asia, lentinin uh, from the shiitake mushroom is licensed and approved. And I think constitutes 25% of cancer care costs in Japan. Many people uh, also take the maitake D fraction uh, from the maitake mushrooms. And then the two that are studied the most are two uh, uh, polysaccharide peptides, uh, uh, PSK known as Crestin in Japan that comes from the Trimedes versicolor or turkey tail mushroom and a similar polysaccharide in China is called a PSP. And these are both licensed and available drugs uh, in Asia. Another one that I'm not familiar with so much is schizophilin uh, from the schizophilin commune, the so-called split gill mushroom, but I don't have much more to say about that, but let's uh, see what we can, uh, yeah. So one of the problems with uh, trials of mushrooms in cancer, oops, let me go back to that one for a minute, is that, uh, can we go back to that slide? One of the problems with clinical trials is that we don't know, yeah, uh, they're often the effects are from test tube studies or animals. Uh, the human trials, as I mentioned, have been done predominantly in Asia, and we tend to be a little you know, worrisome about studies that are not conducted right here in the United States and sort of rank them as a lower uh, uh, threshold of evidence, which is probably not fair. Again, epidemiologic observations like the women in China taking the fresh versus dried mushrooms with green tea uh, or the lower risk of, of breast cancer or the Inoki Toki farmers in Japan having lower rates of cancer have also uh, advised us on mushrooms potential. And then the question is, if we're studying mushrooms, is it the whole mushroom? Is it eaten? Is it in capsules? Is it in extracts, uh, either water extracted or alcohol extracted? Are we looking at the mycelia, the underground component or the fruiting body? And again, this has become uh, very much a uh, controversial area in uh, the field of medicinal mushrooms, uh, some people feel that the mycelia are not the right thing. Other people feel that the mycelia is where the action is. And then are we looking at the whole mushroom or just isolated fractions as the PS PSK and PSP and the active hexose correlated compound? So let's look at maitake, which is the mushroom that the patient was taking, also known as hand of the woods. This is an edible mushroom. And as I mentioned, the maitake D fraction 
is found in both the mycelia and the fruiting body. And it's a, a more purified extract. It's felt to be, again, an immunomodulator, and it may decrease chemotherapy side effects. Now, a, a red flag here is whenever they say it may decrease chemotherapy side effects, the oncologist is going to be concerned that it's doing that by decreasing the blood level of the chemotherapy by way of some interaction with the uh, enzymes that metabolize pharmaceuticals. But I don't think that's been uh, demonstrated in this case. So Maitake, uh, Fungi Perfecti, Paul Stamets company, used to send out a catalog and they used to show you the mushrooms here and what cancers they inhibit uh, up there. And again, uh, the FDA made them stop using this catalog because they were making therapeutic claims suggesting that these mushrooms were in fact active against all these different cancers. And in the absence of human clinical trials, the FDA sort of slapped them on the wrist and say, you can't say that. But you can see uh, that maitake does have activity against breast as well as other uh, cancers. Agaricus is our most favorite uh, mushroom in the United States, unfortunately, because it doesn't really have much taste. And it does contain agaritine, which is a hydrazine analog, hydrazine being used in rocket fuel, which in and of itself is carcinogenic. So all mushrooms must be cooked. All mushrooms must be cooked. Slicing white button mushrooms and throwing them in a salad is a no. They contain a cancer causing compound. In fact, when I eat dinner with Paul Stamets and his wife, if we go out for uh, food where uh, there are white button mushrooms cooked in a meal, he will not, he picks them out. He doesn't even believe that cooking is safe enough, but he tends to be a little cautious. So white buttons and their brown cousins, the criminy, and their giant cousins, the portobello, may have some aromatase inhibitor activity. So good for women with breast cancer uh, who are estrogen receptor positive, but all mushrooms must be cooked. Again, uh, this is the most common edible mushroom and lectins isolated from uh, agaricus increase the sensitivity of lung, colon, and glioblastoma cells to chemotherapy. A total extract of uh, agaricus bisperus, the white button mushroom, and certain isolated fractions inhibit aromatase and effectively decrease breast cancer cell proliferation. So that is a good thing. Uh, in addition, uh, agaricus extract inhibits all prostate cancer cell lines in the test tube and in cultures via increasing apoptosis or programmed cell death and may have a clinical effect in lowering PSA. So it, that's in uh, contrast to other, uh, the active hexose compound and the shiitake mushroom extracts had no effect in prostate cancer patients. Another very delicious uh, medicinal mushroom or mushroom with medicinal qualities is shiitake, uh, the Lentinus idotes mushroom, known as the fragrant mushroom in uh, China. And again, uh, lentinin is a cell wall polysaccharide extracted from the fruiting bodies of the shiitake mushroom, which again is widely used as adjuvant immunotherapy in Japan. And again, the active hexose correlated compound is produced from the mycelia of the mushroom. And this is a substance that my patients are often taking. Personally, I believe that the mushroom itself is the best medicine, uh, better than the activated he uh, uh, hexose correlated compounds or the beta glucan uh, supplements that my patients may take. So this is a, a study looking at uh, Lenten in use in Asia, a 12 year review. Uh, studies of Lenten in, in both Japan and China were reviewed. Quality of life and performance status were improved in patients, uh, as well as uh, uh, all chemotherapy plus Lenten groups exhibited greater effectiveness and response rates compared to those who received chemotherapy alone. And the Lenten treatment also lowered the incidence of adverse effects. Uh, very safe itself. 
18 of 9,500 treatments were associated with reported adverse events. So again, very useful, uh, is a big market in Asia, has not crossed over yet uh, to the US, uh, again, because the studies have not been done here and we tend to be a little phobic of research not done in the United States. Another mushroom that's becoming quite popular is lion's mane or hericium. Uh, becoming popular, it is edible and it may stimulate brain-derived nerve growth factor. So it could be considered as a agent that might protect against chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And a lot of my patients with chemo brain benefit from taking uh, lion's mane uh, capsules or lion's mane associated with other uh, botanicals or uh, mushrooms. Uh, one question I have, because I do do group visits or I did do group visits for patients with brain tumors, uh, should I recommend lion's mane uh, to people with brain, tu brain tumors if it can stimulate brain-derived nerve growth factor? Will that stimulate, uh, you know, formation of brain tumor? And I did just ask that question to one of our neuro-oncologists who seems to be out of the office uh, because she didn't respond to me. I will say if you can find uh, lion's mane in a uh, farmer's market, that it really is delicious. I gave a lecture in Taiwan once many years ago uh, on integrative cancer care. And my host was gonna take me to a steakhouse <laughs> for uh, dinner. And his wife said, you didn't listen to his talk. He doesn't eat red meat. And so instead they took me to a traditional Chinese medicine restaurant where every course was a therapeutic intervention. And the final course was a lion's mane dish that was so fabulous. Uh, I can't, I can't even, you know, I still remember it many years later. So a good source uh, of information about some of the mushrooms is the National Cancer Institute Physician Data Query website. Uh, I was formerly a member of the editorial board and we update uh, information as it comes out. And we just added the medicinal mushrooms. There's a health professional page as well as a patient version. And the mushrooms that are most covered are the ones that I'm gonna talk about now, uh, Trimetes versicolor or turkey tail, as well as reishi. So Trimetes versicolor is a non-edible mushroom. You can see it on a log here, a photo from uh, Paul Stamets's company. It also in the past was known as Coriolis or Polyporus versicolor, better known as turkey tail. In China, it's Yongzhi, the cloud fungus. And this is the one where in Japan, they isolate a PSK. And in uh, uh, China, they isolate a PSP uh, to use as uh, treatment uh, in conjunction with patients getting chemotherapy and radiation. Okay, so it's the PSK, which constitutes 25% of cancer care costs in Japan today. Positive randomized control trials have been done in gastrointestinal malignancies, particularly stomach and esophagus, which are big cancers in Asia, as well as colon and some evidence in breast cancer as well. So Trimetes versicolor uh, is my favorite anti-cancer mushroom. And this comes from a systematic review and meta-analysis of 13 trials uh, looking at PSK and PSP uh, they looked at about 1,300 patients receiving those mushroom extracts, and they took 1,300 in a comparison group that wasn't. And the overall survival at five years was improved uh, in the PSK, PSP group, uh, improved 14%. So not a huge uh, improvement, but statistically significant. For all cancers, there was a 9% absolute reduction in five-year mortality seen. Uh, the effects were more evident for breast, gastric, colorectal cancer uh, compared to esophageal and nasopharyngeal, which are again, two uh, very common cancers found in Asia. So you can see breast there, and that's why I like uh, turkey tail uh, as a mushroom that I recommend uh, to most of the patients that I see. Reishi, Ganoderma lucidum, 
very beautiful, not edible, looks like shellac really. It's called the thousand year mushroom or in China, Lingzhi, the mushroom of immortality. And again, the sugars, the polysaccharides in uh, Ganodermida are definitely immune enhancing. In addition, Ganodermic acid, a triterpenoid, inhibits tumor cell growth in the test tube. So this has a worldwide extract sales of $1.5 billion. And that was from many moons ago when I made that slide. So I can imagine what it must be now. So again, this is a very popular mushroom, not edible. Many of my patients uh, from uh, China buy it and make a tea from the mushroom. I prefer capsule, powder, or tincture personally. It is a symbol of health, longevity, success, and divine power in China. And the beta glute cans from the mushroom stimulate the immune system and the triterpenes also have direct cell killing effects and inhibit an enzyme that allows cancer cells to become invasive and spread. So that mushroom may inhibit tumor metastases. There are a few clinical trials in the literature and most of them, as I said, have been conducted in China. And when we review them, we feel that the quality of, is poor. The Cochrane Collaborative, which does reviews of published information, did review five trials in 2012 and concluded that there was inadequate data to support the use of Ganoderma uh, lucidum in cancer patients. Other studies do support safety when used with chemotherapy and radiation. And I, I think this is an important issue because again, many of my patients tell me that their radiation oncologist or their medical oncologist has asked them, please to stop taking the mushrooms while they're being treated because they're afraid of a potential interaction. The anaderma lucidin uh, polysaccharides uh, do inhibit activities of some of the enzymes uh, that do metabolize uh, pharmaceuticals, but all of this evidence comes from the test tube and not from studies done in people. <clears throat> One of my favorite mushrooms uh, is cordyceps, uh, which is actually not a mushroom, but it's a fungus that parasitizes a caterpillar living in the Tibetan highlands. And the Chinese women's relay team in the 1990s that broke all sorts of land speed records was tested for doping. And the only thing that they were taking was cordyceps sinensis. So it's felt to be, it's used for vigor and stamina. It's felt to improve oxygenation. And it's said to be in Chinese medicine, a lung and kidney tonic. It does restore immune activity when uh, used in patients uh, on chemotherapy. And it may also improve anemia associated with chemotherapy. Uh, cordyceps sinensis is also good, again, for energizing. And for my patients who complain of fatigue, I often recommend cordyceps sinensis. It also may have some effect on libido and male vitality. So it's a good mushroom uh, or fungus uh, for medicinal purposes. So when we look at medicinal mushrooms and cancer, the useful properties against malignancies are the fact that it has some direct anti-cancer activity. They are mild antioxidants. They are immunomodulatory and through that can be anti-inflammatory. Uh, the aromatase inhibition is found in the white buttons, the brown primines and the giant portobellos. Uh, Paul Stamets believes that some mushrooms may have antiviral activity as well. And then they are a source of vitamin D if you put uh, fresh raw mushrooms in the sun. And they may be useful in managing uh, symptoms in patients living with and beyond cancer. Questions that remain unanswered to my mind are which mushroom or mushrooms to use for which cancer patients and when to prescribe them in relation to chemotherapy because the chemo interaction is doubtful, although feared. And how long can mushrooms or should mushrooms be taken? I learned from a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner many years ago that he doesn't believe the body should see the same mushroom every day. And he believes that there are seasonal adjustments that should be made 
that you should take this mushroom in this season and this one in that season. The long-term safety and effectiveness, however, are unclear. There's a book that I'm gonna show you at the end of my presentation uh, that I just read, a Clinical Guide to Medicinal Mushrooms, where he agrees with the Chinese medicine practitioner that the body doesn't like to see, to see the same mushroom every day. And so I often recommend that my patients take turkey tail for four to six weeks, because as other biological agents that we use, it takes time for the mushroom to reach its full potential benefit. And after four to six weeks, that benefit may decline. So I say take turkey tail for four to six weeks and then switch to a, a mushroom uh, that doesn't include turkey tail. I often tell people to take a seven mushroom extract available uh, from uh, host defense. And then the two questions that I already alluded to, are mushrooms safe in patients taking immune, uh, re in immune related cancers, the lymphoma, myeloma, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia? And should they be used with immunotherapy? And those two questions, really, there is no answer at this time. So back to the patient uh, that I started talking about, he had numerous episodes of chemotherapy responses followed by disease progression necessitating further treatment changes. Uh, he was still active two years after his initial diagnosis. He began to film a movie about his experience as a cancer patient. On a visit in September, 2018, they announced that they were contemplating trying to conceive, uh, but the wife was noted to be distressed uh, when the patient offered this information. The wife became an advocate of healthy nutrition and organized events at Facebook to educate coworkers about the optimal diet. When the patient ran out of treatment options, sought a psychedelic therapist in Marin County and did a shared psilocybin experience. The patient himself died November 20th at the age of 34. And his wife uh, became an advocate of the psychedelic uh, interventions uh, for grief and depression. And these are actually uh, the patient and his wife. Uh, you can see very lovely people. Uh, and she has now taken it upon herself to change psychedelics into transformative therapy uh, because of the impact that she had uh, using uh, psilocybin. So this has gotten quite a bit of attention lately. Uh, can magic mushrooms heal us? Psilocybin performs at least as well as leading antidepressants. And uh, there have been studies in patients uh, living with and be beyond cancer, uh, looking at psilocybin in cancer-related anxiety and depression. This is a small randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial in 29 patients with cancer-related anxiety and depression, patients received a single dose of psilocybin or niacin as a control, both in conjunction with a psychotherapy. The primary outcome were anxiety and depression assessed between the groups prior to the crossover at seven weeks. Psilocybin produced immediate, substantial, and su sustained improvements in anxiety and depression, decreased demoralization and hopelessness, increased spiritual well-being and quality of life, and the effects persisted in 60 to 80% of the participants at six and a half months. They also noted improved attitudes towards death. And the authors conclude that psilocybin-induced mystical experience mediated the therapeutic effect. So very popular now is the concept of microdosing and data collected from 4,000 50 microdosers and 4,600 non-microdosers via an iPhone app uh, defined as the success of self-administration with a limited time window of doses of psychedelics that do not impair normal functioning and are predominantly subsensorium. And these are often stacked with other substances to enhance the beneficial effect, like lion's mane mushroom, niacin, both, or even chocolate. And among those reporting mental health concerns, microdosers exhibited lower levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. And the most widely endorsed 
motivation for microdosing was enhancing mindfulness, followed by improving mood, enhancing creativity, and enhancing learning. Both groups did use cannabis and larger doses of psilocybin, psychedelics um, more than the general public. Microdoses were more likely to reduce or abstain from alcohol and tobacco, which is certainly something that oncologists are happy uh, when patients do. <clears throat> so, uh, Entangled Life is a book about how fungi make our world, change our minds and shape our futures. I actually uh, didn't love it, to be honest, but one of my friends listened to it and said, uh, Merlin Sheldrake, who's English, has a great uh, narrating voice and she really, really enjoyed it. Christopher Hobbs' Medicinal Mushrooms, The Essential Guide is the one that I was mentioning where he agrees with me that we shouldn't take the same mushroom every day. We should take one for four to six weeks and then switch to another and then go back to the first one. Uh, so that's the normal recommendation that I make uh, to my patients. I really love that. The pictures are beautiful, but I wonder if he sort of over is overly enthusiastic about the role of medicinal mushrooms in patients with cancer. I think the data need more research is necessary is what we always say in oncology. So, let me move. I am in uh, Oahu at this moment. Uh, if you didn't uh, appreciate that from the pineapple over my shoulder. Uh, so I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Abrams. This is Carly. I'm from BACC. I'll help moderate some of the questions that are coming in. I wanted to start with a, a common one asked by several people of where do you feel like is the best source to buy mushrooms or mushroom products? Is it, are there specialized shops? Is just the grocery short, store okay? What's your recommendation? Well, yeah, so it depends, uh, you know, if we're talking about uh, edible mushrooms or uh, medicinal mushrooms. And, you know, I think it's a good question. As I mentioned, I think you missed my opening disclosure slide. I am a personal friend of Paul Stamets and uh, host defense sends me uh, mushrooms at no cost when I ask for them. But uh, so I, I am biased towards host defense, uh, fungi perfecti, but I will say that I recently uh, started getting consumer lab reports and they are very much against host defense because they say that they're using mushroom mycelia as opposed to the fruiting bodies. Mm -hmm. And they're misguiding the consumer when they have on their bottles and boxes, pictures of the actual mushroom when they're usually actually using the underground mycelia. Now, the books that I just mentioned uh, did demonstrate that mycelia do have biologic and pharmaceutical activity. So, you know, so it is a big controversy. Other people, there are many different companies making medicinal mushrooms. I just happen to like alternating turkey tail with his seven mushroom formula that he named after himself, Stamets 7. It includes seven different mushrooms, which may have anti-cancer activity. Uh, and so I like, for me, that's easy to do, but my patients often come with other mushroom preparations and, you know, I think they're fine. I, I think organic is a good thing. And, you know, whether it's fruiting body or mycelia or maybe a combination of, of both is probably good. Uh, as far as where to buy mushrooms, you know, Again, I like organic, but uh, yeah, because they can concentrate the uh, toxins. So, so uh, that's a good thing. But supermarkets, farmers markets, I don't know that there are specific uh, mushroom stores where you can just get your mushrooms only. Sure. Well, thank you. And then on the subject of switching between mushrooms or not letting your body see the same mushroom each day, could you talk a little bit more about the reasoning behind that? Is it a tolerance? Um, yeah, yes. Is it it is a tolerance? Tolerance. Yeah, the body tolerance. becomes used to it and then it's not responding as well. So I, like I tell my patients, I stop all of my supplements the last four days of every month. Oh. And then on the first of the month, my body says, yay, they're back. I just don't think it's good to take the same 
supplement every day forever. Sure. Because, yeah, you do become, we're sort of like bacteria. If you give this bacteria the same antibiotic, then there's going to be some that are going to become resistant. So I think mixing and matching is a good thing to do. So I say take one for four to six weeks, which is also what uh, Christopher Hobbs says it takes for something to become uh, its maximum benefit before it loses it and then switch at four to six weeks. Again, uh, my, my mentors at the University of Arizona were not impressed when I sent them a, a picture of the paragraph from Christopher Hobbs' book because he also said it was pretty much his own feeling and not based on any uh, data. So they told me I have to be a little bit more evidence demanding. Sure. But it makes comments a good sense to me. And the fact I, I am a fan of traditional Chinese medicine and the fact that it's supported by the practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine that I uh, believe in a lot uh, is helpful. Sure. Well, thank you. Um, I a few more questions coming in. Everyone's saying fascinating talk and information. Um, there's some questions on mushroom use in uh, related to hormonal therapy that you mentioned. So one person just wanted to clarify if on hormone therapy is taking mushrooms not a good idea. No, if on hormone therapy, mushrooms are fine, Got in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I give it to all of my patients on aromatase inhibitors and also tell them to eat their agaricus species the white button, the brown criminy, and the giant portobello, but they must be cooked. And then they also wanted some clarification. Are, are there studies or is there data that shows that mushrooms can fully replace aromatase inhibitors? Or do you always use them in sort of no. an adjuvant? No, I, I would never recommend that whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Um, no. Yeah. Another question um and i i saw this part where you mentioned specifically all mushrooms should be cooked and so the question is the i i just wanted to clarify or have you share some more information i know you mentioned the button mushrooms but just to be clear the question from the audience is how should these mushrooms be consumed for best absorption and it sounds like all mushrooms, not just the button mushrooms, should be cooked. Yeah, you, you don't benefit from the mushrooms uh, unless they're cooked. Similar, you know, it's a, that whole raw movement, you know, that you have to eat all vegetables raw. Yeah. I, you know, I think that cooking actually releases more of the nutrients uh, in most uh, uh, plant products. Mm -hmm. And similarly, mushrooms, all mushrooms must be cooked. And that's, you know, that's, Usually when I give a lecture, that's the take home point that people resonate with most because nobody knew that. And, you know, when we used to do lunches uh, at, at our uh, San Francisco General Hospital uh, cancer faculty meetings, uh, my assistant would order the food. And when the salad would come with white button mushrooms, she would pick them out <laughs> because she knew that, that that was the case. So, yeah, all mushrooms must be cooked a great take home point and something I learned. And then there's a lot of questions on, is there an optimum way to cook them or with an, with oil steamed? If you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I think stir frying wok, you know, the Asian methods. I, I don't think, you know, if you're making a soup, you can boil them, I guess. But uh, again, many of my uh, Chinese patients do make teas out of some of their mushrooms, uh, but uh, I just like them stir fried or, you can even uh, bake them. My husband, who's a macrobiotic chef, usually puts uh, shiitake or oyster mushrooms, uh, slices them, puts them in the uh, oven and bakes them at 450 with maybe a little soy sauce or herb salt and, or some oils. Yeah, uh, those, those are really good. In fact, uh, we do uh, oyster mushrooms. He cuts them really thin and they actually, they, we don't eat meat, but they taste like bacon. Mm. It's really weird. Well, we we do eat the uh, we eat lamb and and poultry and fish, so we do eat meat, but we don't eat pork and beef. Got it. That's rich flavors. Um, 
One question related to the tea question, how can a mushroom be poisonous, but drinking the tea is not toxic? Say that again. I how that. can a mushroom, you mentioned some mushrooms which were poisonous, but drinking the tea was okay? And just no, I didn't mention any poisonous okay. mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. I mean, there are mushrooms that are poisonous and that's why, you know, we become very phobic of mushrooms. I mean, we think you're going to eat a mushroom and it's going to rot your liver and you're going to die, or you're going to eat a mushroom and have a psychedelic experience and be out of control. So that's the Western attitude towards mushrooms. We're fungophobic, but uh, there are, um, you know, I don't recommend people go uh, hunting for mushrooms in the woods and then randomly eating them if they're not good at identifying them because mm -hmm. there definitely are toxic mushroom species. Sure. But none of them that I mentioned are toxic mushrooms. I just said that they're not edible because they're of their nature. This one is like a piece of shellac, so it's not something you're gonna eat. I see. I see. Okay. I think that was the point of the that they're not edible, but in that case can can be made into right. tea. That's yeah. why we take them as tinctures or or capsules. Different yeah. form. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Perhaps one more question to end on. The viewers wondering if they want to begin adding medicinal mushrooms to their regimen, how should they go about it? Who should they contact? Where can they go? Should they contact what? Who can they contact or where should they go to seek out adding medicinal mushrooms to their cancer regimen? Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to let your oncologist know and the oncologist will generally say, no, don't do that because, you know, you're going to rot your liver or you're going to have a psychedelic experience. And, or they may refer them to a, a pharmacist to ask if it's okay to take in conjunction with your current medications. But, you know, unfortunately, the data that people use to say, don't take those mushrooms because they're going to interfere with your treatment is largely based on test tube or mouse studies and not human studies because they don't really exist, except the body of evidence we have from Asia that shows that it's very safe and in fact enhances the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation if patients take some medicinal mushrooms in conjunction with their conventional cancer care. But most of our oncology buddies don't know that unless they've heard me speak before or have some interest in medicinal mushrooms. So always something to share with your oncologist and see how willing they are to allow that. Great, great advice. Well, thank you again for the informative presentation. We appreciate your time. And to everyone viewing, we'll end the talk now and see you on our next session. Hello. Thanks, Dr. Abrams.